Hello everyone, today we make a concise political and military comparison between five medieval European powers of this larger Slavic area, we can say, um, and that are Poland, Bohemia, Russia, Hungary and Bulgaria. And every time I look at the history of these single countries, I say I, mean, I should make a pretty large hefty video about every single one of them as well also the others telling the truth but also maybe in a single video it starts becoming heavy and as you know I'm instead more interested in general in kind of more concise analysis but with a kind of a comparative and you know in-depth kind of perspective and I think this can be a novelty or an interesting point of view I already did something about this with the crowns of Bohemia, Poland and Hungary I made a video on it that there is a, a playlist I created that it, that is medieval Slavs in Eastern Europe that contains them and I think in general this is a useful way to kind of highlight what substantially will even the differences in the dimensions of these powers actually were because if you concentrate just on one country you you lose you tend to lose a perspective like um you can't say yeah okay the, the word is neighbors etc but if un, un, until you you don't focus on that specific um uh, actor you you can't fundamentally understand even what the the value of a single power in, in that context particularly was and i chose this five powers that, as you, as you understand, are very different, uh, and they they have kind of uh, different kind of dimensions and um, political strengths, right? But they still have something in common overall, if anything, for the dominant Slavic character, um, but also other structural characteristics, in fact, because in this um, area of Slavic and also Eastern Europe had been forming during the 11th and the 12th century, these entities of fairly large territorial extension, but objectively with not much of a great political cohesion, right? These were, um, and, and as you understand, this varies a lot, because if you take Russia, well, technically it wasn't even a kingdom, right? It was a cluster of principalities, um, if you, and it, it was also the largest area, telling the truth. Instead, you see a more a smaller but kind of more politically compact power like Bohemia that had more continuity over time. You see the Kingdom of Poland that directly has a monarchy but it, it vanishes into, the, into the several principalities for a very long time. Um, and uh, you have Hungary which looks more like an empire objectively than, than a kingdom on its own and considering the the uh, control that it had in the surrounding kind of smaller uh, polities and then peoples. You see Bulgaria that instead re-emerges uh, uh, during um, the 12th and 13th century um, with the weakening of the Byzantine Empire, also its eclipse with the, the, the Latin um, one that, that appeared after the Fourth Crusade. Um, and that had had instead of you know quite of a large extension before, but eventually was uh, was subjugated uh, for for some time by the, by the Byzantines. So it's a very different and sh shaded. I, I could have talked actually about other entities. For example, I realized we'd never talked about the area uh, of Romania and um, uh, Wallachia, for example, that are partly encompassed now respectively by. Uh, Bulgaria, uh, also with a kind of dominant black element in, in certain cases, actually on the same um, Bulgarian area, or at least a, a, an ensemble of uh, of their cooperation, and in part and under Hungary, right? But for example, we never talk about Serbia. We also rarely focus, strictly speaking, on Lithuania, um, and also the, the the various Russian principalities were actually. You know, interesting, but same thing you can say, I don't know, the difference between Bohemia and Moravia or the different areas of Poland. Um, so there is technically a lot we have to discuss, and it's obvious that this video will not enter into the too many technicalities. But this is also just to give an idea uh, to someone that um, maybe has never heard about the stories of these countries, which which is unfortunately true, especially in kind of... Uh, the westernmost uh, Europe, or also, I don't know, North America, I don't know, that many people wrote me and said, you know, I never heard about this country's histories. Um, they, they're they objectively very, very interesting. So just know that we will be talking about them on Schwerpunkt, just like all the others, without any um, 
problem in uh, on the long run like the, i i don't choose these topics myself actually um because i leave it to chance like and it's obvious that on certain manuals th these areas are I'll dealt with like um less and that's the reason maybe we, why we talked more about i don't know western europe but um the it's kind of uh, i i think it's unfair um and it doesn't render justice at all to entities that at the time especially had actually a big importance in the regionally speaking and that uh continuing on even during you know the, the early modern times in certain cases to you know to be very very significant powers speaking about Poland Lithuania um and um this is however also a chance to to you know it's like a challenge to make a bit of of synthesis uh, every once in a while and see if it's feasible right because also every time i make videos like this i, I realize that someone is going to be discontent because like why haven't you inserted this other counter why uh did you treat this so superficially well i think i explained it now in this introduction and we can we can start it and as we were saying before you know why these areas were so you know territorially extended but also politically troubled right well these were essentially um scarcely populated areas overall right compared to to other regions of europe so um they also didn't quite have mm, precise natural borders right the the populations that had inhabited them um uh, were you know had spread since early medieval times in these large areas especially from from the slavic origin but also other peoples coming from the steppes settling in i don't know in the pannonian plain or the bulgarian um area lower danube um and or in southern russia so um these were um the territories that had um, were the migration era basically had never quite ended like the the degree of sedentarization was on average lower than in the west there was uh also less infrastructures from from the ancient world these were areas that had not known urbanization up to the uh, the high middle ages they had um let's say um, of course i'm uh, you know it depends where you say because for example bulgaria had but trace being part of the the roman empire but others not so we're going to put here everything on average in the cauldron but um also the face of certain regions had had objectively changed like for example the same trace of the uh of of i don't know the second century ad wasn't the same one of the 11th right um and, and um th there was this continuous pressure especially also fr from the east from the steps of, of new waves of people so that every once in a while arrived and contributed in part i think also to to cripple the local uh structures and at the same time to kind of maintain uh, and shape in this sense a um and and build let's say better uh a, a sense of mm, let's say proto national i mean national in the sense of of, of a people of a cohesion right that emerged in fact from common origins where originally these peoples had not like the slavs originally were all in the same cauldron then eventually of course they spread around they settled in certain areas that have some geographical continuity but non excessively and therefore they start shaping their certain political structure certain societies that eventually evolved at this point in in something consistent we today we discuss essentially the uh, up to the 13th century from the the 11th to the 13th century and and this is the moment in which in fact these mm, entities start to emerge as well defined institutional powers right more or or less well defined as we will see now um and another problem was uh, in fact economical we have said now about the general lack of large urban centers and also of a mercantile economy right and this is a problem because a monarchy needs money a lot of money to create strong governmental structures and to counter especially the growing power of the rural nobility right initially it had been fairly easy to put together many tribes um to let's say uh, invade certain areas and to kind of maintain this uh semi permanent militarized status but uh, with progressive sanitarization and the um, strengthening of of uh, local structures 
the nobility starts uh, and, and undergoes this process also of certain cases of par partial westernization and Frankish model for which um, it's the, the land that starts becoming, especially a lot of land in, in the hands of few people to become a problem for, for the centralization of the monarchy because um, fundamentally uh, the, the nobility thinks still in the old tribal um, uh, mindset for which everybody theoretically is a freeman, right? Which is true only when they reason to, uh, you know, with with the king, because when they reason with the communities that they, they control, of course, they, they stress instead the fact that they are nobles, they're upper class, they're elite, and they, they need to, to rule. Um, and there's a strongly warlike character, also culturally speaking, behind this. And, and that's why also the creation of certain centers, um, new towns that happens. Uh, this is particularly famous in Bohemia, but you can find it uh, in many areas uh, of the ones that we have marked in here. Uh, becomes really a, a, an important political strategy to try to form kind of a of a, of a middle class that can counter in part the push of the nobility, but fundamentally. Uh, it fails uh, in every of these contexts. Uh, most of it, Poland, Bohemia, Hungary would become essentially elective monarchs for these reasons. Uh, the Bulgarian revival had was, you know, it was long enough, but also was, you know, was to to be overwhelmed by the um, the presence either of you know uh, enemy neighbors or uh, simply by the, the, the Ottoman invasion at the end Russia also undergoes a, a very different and complicated transformation that fundamentally however uh, sees the collapse of any centralized uh, institution if there had ever been any because technically yeah the Mongols kind of wipe out uh, everything that resembles some form of that, but even the late Kevin Roos times weren't, you know, they, they were just for further decentralization and uh, so political and social certification on a local base and not on a centralized base. Um, so the, 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 co the concept here is to frame these um, powers in, in, in a dimension that is actually dramatic because these areas were unstable. Right, and they and and therefore warfare ensued, and this created for further problems. Um, these areas were also given um, a sense of identity by Christianization. Christianization helped the local elites to build kind of a more territorially oriented um, um, government that uh, could be referential to the local people um, and also the the presence of certain neighbors especially the German Empire for what concerns especially Poland Bohemia and Hungary and the Byzantine Empire of course for Bulgaria and Russia will mm, contribute uh, osmotically and politically and diplomatically and also uh, through the same Christianization that has started from there um, to to make become the, the local political and military structures more robust. So I think we can start with Poland that is the, the northwesternmost power of the ones we have listed. So Poland first became a, a kingdom in 1024 under Boleslav I, consisting of a large number of federated western Slav tribes, which Boleslav's dynasty, the, the Piasts, had succeeded in uniting during the course of, of the previous century. Uh, that's where Christianization had, in fact, also been embraced by the Piasts uh, themselves. Um, and in Poland, as in Russia, as we'll see later, however, uh, succession, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> followed the appanage system, whereby inheritance was divisible amongst all surviving sons. Mm -hmm. which is a custom um, coupled with, with a rec uh, recurrent desire amongst the various tribes to regain their independence often resulted in, in uh, bloody civil wars and in disintegration of the Polish kingdom. Now this is very important because uh, these dynasties had uh, had their fortune as we have seen before in essentially channel channeling 
uh, the strengths of several tribes, several clans that have supported them initially, but then when the monarchy uh, assumes a more directly territorial character, um, Poland uh, fragments into this series of, 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 of duchies that um, in the name of the Piast uh, legacy, which they, they, they had, because technically they were all part of the same dynasty um, as rulers, but they were like kind of um, building a power that uh, from, from from a strictly local base that couldn't be reconciliated with a with a more centralized direction. This this had been a problem actually for the same, for example, in, in Frankish Europe. Um, that just at this time, right when when the Slavs are, arrived to to feudalism, like they were or, trying to find measures to counter the uh, the side effects of feudalism, for which in this private, completely pli- private political mentality, um, the uh, in fact there was no male that could not inherit right from his father, and therefore you know any. Uh, att- that there was a, a progressive effort to build more centralized structures and to eventually making them involved in two kingdoms that that weren't going to be elective but dynastic in fact and that's why in Western Europe they, they made it in these other areas of Central and Eastern Europe it was kind of uh, uh, more difficult on the long run but it was, um, th- there was a possibility let's say for these countries also to evolve to more centralized institutions, right? And there were events that, as we were also saying yesterday, relatively to Poland specifically, like, I don't know, the Mongol invasions that uh, surely didn't help in the process, right? Especially, this is very evident in Russia, where, as we were saying before, centralization could not be achieved, but still, you know, Russian politics and society were kind of much more egalitarian before the Mongol invasions than instead, instead triggers a radical uh, seniorialization and social certification and political uh, elitary culture, right? That you don't find in in countries like Poland or Hungary that were actually much more, um, in this sense, much more orderly uh, from a, in, in terms of local representatives, for example, it was quite important, much more similar to actually to, to the German Empire, just for making a comparison. Then, then what happened in the East was fr- frankly uh, incredible. Like uh, what what the Mongols could achieve uh, uh, in in Russia as an influence, um, and so that in fact, going back to Poland, with a single exception of King Boleslav the uh, Third, ruling between eleven o two eleven thirty two, in two in the two centuries. Answering uh, the death of Boleslav II in 1079, the Polish kingdom as such didn't exist, de facto, right? It, it was r- replaced instead by a plethora of duchies under members of the PS dynasty that achieved the number of 72 at, at one point, right? So, so me, think about what that means. Um, Naturally, this doesn't mean that they were all completely separated. Of course, they kind of stuck in different chunks, etc., and they had um, or, uh, constant contact one with each other, coordination, but still, that's not a very uh, you know, healthy symptom for, for a centralized mark, of course. And uh, the, the greatest... Mm, they were also the more the more powerful of these, and of course, the, 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 one, the strongest ones were Little Poland, uh, at least... Um, at first, until 1180, um, held by the senior Piast dynast, then Great Poland, Silesia, uh, Kujawia, um, Mazovia, and Sandomir. And eventually, in the 70s and the 80s of the 13th century, several Piast dukes died without male heirs, hmm? and other fragmented duchies, uh, especially Great Poland and Mazovia, were reunited by force of arms. So the title of king was finally revived by Premislav II, Duke of Great Poland, who uh, had himself crowned in 1295, but it was not until 1320 that the Polish monarchy was re-established on a firm footing, right? 
And this naturally is also the merit, however, of local political structures that had somewhat improved over time at the point that you know they were more easy uh, to to manage, to to control, and and favored also for the sake of of, of these same dynasts' uh, continuity, the progressive you know uh, agglomeration and um, also naturally dynastic uh, reconnection that was always aiming, of course, at keeping concentrated uh, concentrated under same uh, ruler the largest assets as, as possible right so this is a trend that you can objectively see in every um in every european country at this point and uh, especially talking especially about poland uh, the situation compared to other areas of uh, you know uh, that we we discussed today was not even so disastrous uh, after all i mean the, the polish kingdom managed at one point, effectively, to enucleate itself. It was not a farce. There was a monarchy. There was a uh, recognized, um, theoretically at least, central direction uh, that would evolve into the Polish kingdom institutionally and eventually later on the, also in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And and, and I think the, the match was lost rather during the early modern era rather than the Middle Ages. After all, for those places and times, you know, they, they were doing well enough, right? Um, in, in terms of military culture, what can we say? Great Poland, so looking at what, what Poland was basically uh, at the beginning, let's say at the end of the 10th century, Great Poland um, around Poznan and Little Poland around Krakow were united. So this is the bulk, uh, essentially, from which the the the, 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 the core of, of the Polish core evolved. Um, Mazovia, um, northeast of Warsaw, and Silesia um, uh, to the uh, northwest in Lausitz, in what is now Eastern Germany, were all drawn into the Polish state in the early 11th century. Mm? It's not a few, actually. Um, even Pomerania on the Baltic was occupied for a while before eventually falling under a German domination as briefly were what we are uh, uh, now the Czech Republic and Slovakia plus parts of Ukraine further east mm-hmm. right uh, a very interesting and underestimated uh, factor is actually how these monarchies even into the lower later middle ages like between Bohemia Poland Hungary they they actually Tried uh, silver um, region, uh, you know, to 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 make dynastic collections of the various crowns and to kind of um, unite these larger elements across Central Europe. Uh, that also in there were were short lived, but definitely contributed to at least strengthen the power of those uh, countries that managed to to extend their formal, the, those monarchs managed to extend their formal control over these, um, um, the, the, the other territories. And in fact, the, the borders here are were, were also floating by, by certain standards. Of course, there were certain barriers, certain mountains, certain rivers that, of course, could kind of, you know, represent this, uh, um, uh, you know, detachments, but um, the 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 general idea is that politically speaking, these groups could be still put together. Uh, at one point, even the, the same Germans could uh, sum up the the, the German, uh, namely, the uh, the Bohemian crown, even the Polish crown, technically speaking. That, but it didn't. It, it ended in nothing. Even the Habsburgs, for example, at the beginning of the fourteenth century, had reached in the area an enormous power. It eventually um, faded during the course of the century. But just for saying that. Um, these were actually areas with a lot of potential, and that that also was in part, um, you know, th- there were lost opportunities and certain coincidences that made history taking another path, but actually a different um, uh, direction w- was possible in, in some in some instances. Um, what what is also very interesting, but today we will not cover, is how uh, objectively uh, there th- there is this. Mm, uh, election of uh, foreign monarchs, like think about the Angevins that go into Hungary and into Poland, uh, 
uh, Luxembourg's in Bohemia, right? And some some of these experiments were successful, others not. For example, Bohemia, Luxembourg, Bohemia during the 14th century is literally the, the heart of Europe, also culturally speaking. Uh, you know, it, th there is a strengthening and structuration of the uh, central um, administration, uh, etc. Um, but also, continuity was tied, in effect, to dynastic dynamics that also could, in fact, mess up um, the, the picture after all. Um, and considering, say, Poland now, still, um, still by the year 1100, um, well, the country occupied much of the same territory as it does today, with the exception of Pomerania on the Baltic coast and the southern Prussian lands. And these frontiers remained relatively unchanged, though Lausitz and Silesia were lost to the Germans in the 13th century. And such losses were partially compensated by eastern gains in the 40s of the 14th century, for example. Um, uh, the Polish um, acquired um, uh, Ruthenia and Galicia from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which had itself only recently taken them from a fragmented and weakened Russia. Mm -hmm. So, actually, even in fact, the Russian borders were geographically speaking, much closer, like up to Moldavia, um, up to the Carpathians, actually. Um, and mm, so it's even difficult to, to see what, what uh, you know, what, what corresponds roughly to today's, uh, uh, you know, ethnography, because actually it's very different. And, of course, many centuries of history changed a lot of things in terms of settlements, of um, colonization, of deportations, of simple... Uh, destructions and uh, massacres, etc. So it, it's it's difficult even to make a comprehensive. But of course, the uh, eventually Poland would take a, a very different shape from the one. Even it was by 1100, like it would shift uh, substantially towards towards the east, um, in part, while the Germans actually eating up progressively the the, the western part, right? And, and Germanizing those lands in the process, this happened. There was a very heavy Germanization. Um, the German colonization in all these countries was present. It went as far as, uh, you know, uh, there were actually pre existing even Germanic communities, we think, as far as Crimea. Uh, but these, in these high medieval times, they were reinforced uh, all over, you know, the, the Sudetenlands in Romania. Um, in, in Bohemia, there was a very consistent element. Think about Silesia. Um, in Poland as well. So um, this was very important for the same monarchies because actually German colonization was invited by the same. Uh, it depends, like, you know, if it was how it would evolve, for example, in the Teutonic Order, well, that's a wholly really different story. Those settled, in fact, as Polish vassals, right, in, in Prussia, uh, eventually becoming kind of stronger than the same uh, Polish kingdom at one point and creating a lot of problems for which, of course, the Poles had to fight to, you know, to reduce the, their power, to the, the, their threat. Um, but, I mean, local communities of craftsmen, even mercenaries, even of knights, this was not just from Germany, actually, they were present from all, as far as England, uh, Spain, and Italy. They were settled in countries like Hungary, for example, to create kind of a foreign uh, class of of, um, of feudatories that could be, in the sense, more loyal to the crown, because they, coming from abroad, they were, that was the, the first point of reference that they had, while the local nobility was growing against the attempts of centralization of the markings, in fact, of style, kind of style to them and these forces, and in fact, developing even a certain kind of uh, xenophobia that was paraded and uh, as um, you know, in fact, as a kind of proto-national character of identity, but it was actually a, a counter um, push against uh, against the monarchy. And then, when these single nobles sometimes came kings themselves, they were obviously they tried to centralize in turn. Um, but it's important because this kind of strengthened even a certain idea of local identity that at the beginning wasn't quite there because these peoples had largely settled as tribes, like right? different clans that had on their own kind of individual idea. Instead, 
after sedentarization and after being part of this ensemble, they were starting to reason even as Polish, as Bohemians, as Hungarians, like, and this is what eventually would, you know, contribute to create the, even the modern local, local identities. Um, so, um, the, at this point, um, in, in Polish warfare, like, well, like this, the, 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 the monarchy was being formed, um, Poland had matured uh, from, say, the, the broader uh, Slavic background that it had had in this context with, with Eastern, other Eastern populations, a substantial um, cavalry, right? It seems that the Poles had at this time, especially compared to peoples like the Bens, the Vilses, and the Obodrites that were actually close uh, territorially, um, more cavalry and also kind of well armed, which actually speaks for a discreet um, uh, military, militarization of society, uh, initially speaking. Um, and the, the, the local Slavic uh, communities were somewhat, they had this kind of momentum still. For example, by the early 12th century, uh, the coastal ones possessed war fleets which raided as far as Norway and uh, had also developed effective light cavalry tactics that were similar to the neighboring Prussians and, and Lithuanians. Mm -hmm. And by the early 13th century, the Slav princes of what are now the Baltic coastal provinces of Germany were Christian members of a German warrior aristocracy um, as well. They joined in the Northern Crusades against their pagan neighbors and fought in typical European style. This is very important because in Poland, as we were recalling yesterday, there was a massive German cultural influence from an uh, equipment point of view. You can find even in vocabulary. Uh, iconographically speaking, you see that the, the, ultra, the, the Polish ultra-elite was literally identical in terms, for example, of panoplies and lifestyle uh, to the the German neighbors and um, in Bohemia you find even part of the Czech nobility actually Germanizing their own names to fit in more broadly as we will see Bohemia has a different history because Bohemia is literally uh, encompassed within the, the Holy Roman Imperial borders and it has uh, its own institutional prestige in that sense so um, Bohemia is the most heavily Germanized of all these, uh, surely more than Poland. Even, of course, this depends even on which region we're talking about, because, for example, Silesia is you know, probably way more Germanized individually than, of course, than Bohemia as well, that maintained a, uh, a you know, stronger Slavic core, of course, and um, compared to the, the German element. But um, this is just for saying that there was a broader participation, like you can't say you know, from from one side there were the Germans, from one side the Slavs. There was this this general push that the Germans were making towards the east, and in fact putting these powers in difficulty. A part of the Christianization of the uh, of the Poles, of the Bohemian, but also of the Danes had happened because objectively of of, of German pressure, right? So these aristocracies that were already looking at the Frankish Christian model as a way to centralize build, building cities, churches, having a local territorial administration, etc. Um, also converted uh, to Christianity to fit in with a broader Christian uh, group. So what we talk about today, by the way, uh, is two split areas, religiously speaking, Bo Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary fitting into the Roman a Christian uh, branch, and um, in the the B Bulgaria and 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 Russia in the in the Byzantine uh, Orthodox one. Although Bulgaria, in part, was also floating, not much maybe because of a local, different local feeling, spiritual uh, tendencies, but much because they they having the Byzantines as the, their enemies. Of course, they winked at the Pope in Rome, and and sometimes they even recognized the papacy as a point of reference for the Bulgarian Church. But the the point I was making is that, for example, if you look at a great 
king like uh, Ottokar II of Bohemia, well, he he's the one that actually founded Königsberg. It were, was called in this way in you know, in his name, and it was normal for for these Islamic mm, um, kings at this point and 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 their noble elite as well to participate to the Northern Crusades against their pagan. Uh, neighbors, uh, to which, however, they, they also shared a uh, way more in common that the Germans did at this time. So it, it's interesting because it's it's a way also to broaden their own nets of clientele to always aim at this, um, you know, interference between, uh, you know, uh, within, na- you know, the, the surroundings uh, affairs to be recognized as rulers to um, to have a, ne- a political influence in all these countries, and there wasn't much of a um, of a of a great distance, but by, by all these powers, uh, after all, and we have seen in the case of Poland, its political fragmentation naturally favoring largely would kind of side with one part or the other, right? And Bohemia, especially especially during the 13th century, rising to to, to an enormous power. That was actually the largest one in the Holy Roman Empire in itself, after the distinction of the Hohenstaufen. Um, so, mm, by the early, um, uh, let's say, mm, the Polish Slavs, of course, never became German, right? This, <laughs> this is important to stress. They they remained, however, under considerable German military influence. This is what we care about. Uh, an armored cavalry cavalry elite is witnessed since the 10th century and of course it had already existed before but it was reinforced uh, during the following centuries um, as, although the majority of Polish horsemen still fought as um, largely unarmored or lightly armored cavalry like their um, pagan neighbors of the northeast right? Uh, we, we think th- there was actually also some kind of developed Polish archery, especially in, at the beginning of these centuries, and uh, Polish warfare included, um, you know, wide use of simple bow, but also long bow, um, especially between the 10th and 12th century, seeming a b- very, you know, very, a very important weapon uh, in Polish warfare. And in the southeast of Poland, instead, we encounter uh, even Central Asian influence, like these peoples that had Swarmed from, from the, the depths of uh, of Asia, still you know, uh, pouring uh, in the area of the steppes and arriving as far as in fact uh, as Poland, um, even before the uh, the most famed uh, uh, Mongol invasion, uh, that caused actually a great change within the same political and military culture of Poland, uh, as it was actually devastating right not not as much as in russia as we will see later but still important even to in part i think to to cripple uh you know po- the possibility of further centralization but still developing a stronger kind of uh, seigneurial um culture in poland uh, inspired by the you know the, the western model of, of the steps that that are present, in fact, and and we see that this influence that, that the Poles received was not just direct from the Steppes peoples that inhabited at its southeastern borders, but it actually came from the same Kievan Russia, and even from Hungary. Uh, Hungary, actually, we will see it later, would maintain a Steppes military culture for a very long time, and in certain region, in certain areas, even a literally kind of a semi-nomadic transhumant. Uh, character of some communities, and this influence is apparent in military uh, custom in horse harnesses and some weapons, right? And in in the other areas, let's say uh, between the tenth and the twelfth century, the Polish military equipment was closer to that of Germany. Objectively, there weren't so many differences; the, 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 you can't differentiate them. Um, uh, and part of the reason being that most weapons, especially swords, were were imported from from the German area, um, and uh, we can't see it, this influence probably so even from certain spearheads and other weapons. Uh, but Polish warfare maintained also this more ethnic, traditional, 
character as it's evidenced by the use of long shafted light axes um, certain uh, types of helmets like the directly r riveted form uh, that were a, sp a specifically Slavic f feature and in, in the mid 12th century the Polish kingdom as we've seen began to disintegrate uh, into this series of petty principalities but this did not halt the process of Frankization, say, of, of military culture. Um, crossbows began to replace uh, bows, especially among uh, infantry, but not only. Um, and heavy cavalry equipment uh, became virtually identical to that of Germany and of Bohemia, even if somewhat substantially more old-fashioned. Um, and yet, Polish cavalry tactics still displayed some Eastern features, but they were more dynamic, more um, also d the terrain in certain areas kind of was more fit to that than other areas of Central Europe. And so, as in so many parts of the area, the Mongol invasions led to considerable military and technological changes uh, in the later 13th and 14th century. Right. This this is especially evident in light cavalry tactics that uh, were, you know, increasingly more um, uh, Eastern influenced. We we can say uh, we can see it from armor that in the east of Poland, uh, so an, an increase of the lamellar type, for example, and uh, even by a horse archery that seemingly was somewhat revived um, always in the southeast um, around the, the 14th century um, yet, and what this is particularly important because it kind of speaks for this bulk of Slavic political military culture that remains uh, intact solidly intact in Poland um, Polish armies included still at this point large numbers of infantry that were now the, the consequence of the sedentarization of the, the Slavic peoples in the area since century and had not collapsed like instead uh, would happen in Russia during the, the, the Mongol invasion that basically brings to the rise of cavalry to, to the stars right and in Poland instead that that structure like Poland suffered pretty much of the Mongol invasions uh, we know it archaeologically speaking uh, the guards were the the, the ancient uh, Slavic fortifications in timber and earth were were raised to the ground and rebuilt in more massive and robust um, stone structure, more similar to the, the Western models after the, the Mongol invasion. And um, and and yet the you know the, the kind of this kind of properly central European character was, was remained intact, right? Um, like the Eastern influences were limited to, to only to, to certain areas in a, in, in a consistent form. Um, for example, the army led by Vladislav Jokietka, um, I don't know whether I, co I pronounce it correctly, in 1330, reportedly consisted um, 2,100 uh, heavily armored cavalry, 20,000 light cavalry and some 30,000 assorted infantry that actually is probably an exaggeration like the world numbers are inflated but but it still speaks for this proportionally at least for, for this important presence of infantry that even had was represented by the middle class but by the, the local town militias etc and partly by the peasantry presumably that was still there, it still worked, like, unlike in other regions that instead with a Mongol invasion further east were kind of overwhelmed and started fighting essentially as Mongol armies, as we will see now, especially with Russia. And now let's talk about Bohemia, that was smaller than Poland of course, but it became an autonomous kingdom uh, formally in 1158 under the Premislet dynasty and figuring as a prominent actor in, in, in Central Europe and in uh, the Holy Roman Imperial policy and even military affairs, right? The, the Bohemians had, uh, you know, stayed there in pretty close contact since the kind of German Europe since since the times of, uh, you know, let's say of 
is better with Frankish Europe since the times of Carolingians, uh, and that had to revive, in fact, their expansion towards the Danube, um, and had put into alert the the Bohemians because, of course, you know the 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 Avar Khaganate was was uh, you know taken out by the Carolingians. That that was an important. Uh, um, factor of, of development even for the local Slavic uh, powers that had somewhat struggled to to kind of uh, free themselves from the Avar yoke, historically speaking. And Bohemian history is, v- is very fascinating in this period and it was ruled by the House of Premis, uh, even if it's not pronounced like this uh, in Czech, but you know, we, the, the Premis lit dice, you know, it is the first Czech ruling house founded according to tradition by diplomat Premis, right, who was married to the princess Libuja, I think it's pronounced. And the, the members of the Premis dynasty ruled Bohemia and the lands associated with it from about the, the 9th century to 1306, right. So we're talking about more than half of a millennium. And just think, it was one of the most famous and prestigious uh, um, European uh, monarchies, right, uh, at the time. And um, the head of the Premislit house was usually designated uh, a prince or duke, the Knizia, I think it's pronounced, until 1198, when Premis Otakar I raised Bohemia to the status of a hereditary kingdom, within the Holy Roman Empire. And the importance of this territory in Central Europe was actually great since ancient times, you know, Bohemia being fundamentally uh, well-defined geographically by the surrounding mountains and also being uh, metal-rich lands, the the Bohemian mines were very important and this is also what favored the, you know, the the construction of a monarchy in, in the area. Um, think about the continuity, uh, even with the old name of, of Bohemian Bojanum, because of the boy who had created exactly an important Celtic power there back then. Eventually, the Marcomannia took their place. Th- so the Slavs that settled there progressively, uh, you know, constructed this unity. Uh, even if closer lands, for example, the Bohemia substantially emerges after the fall of Great Moravia, and this area is. W- were troubled actually, especially by the the uh, also by the hunger invasions at one point. But uh, the resilience of of these lands uh, are evidenced by, in fact, by the emergency of the same uh, the emergence of the same premisely uh, rulers. And actually, historical records for of the early premisely rulers are scanty. Like according to the legend. Prince Borivoy is said to have been converted to Christianity by Saint Methodius um, in the mid 9th century. And Bohemia was, however, consolidated politically in the 10th, and the best known of, the, of its rulers at the time was Borivoy's grandson, Venceslas I, of whose zeal for spreading Christianity in his dominions contributed to his martyr, right, committing committed according to the legend by his pagan brother Boleslav I, reigned from uh, between 900, uh, let's say, we don't know whether 929 and 35 to 967, uh, whichever the story went, uh, this is obvious that there were certain conflicting interests um, from the side of the local nobility that naturally saw Christianization as a way to, you know, renounce the more um, to the less stratified, kind of more egalitarian um, um, tribal asset for building something more structured, uh, that of, a, of an ecclesiastical hierarchy backed by a secular monarchy that was called to to support and to, to, to guide the area. Um, and Venceslas subsequently came to be venerated as the patron saint of Bohemia. Bohemia. And during the rule of Boleslav II, 967-999, the Christian church in Bohemia was organized, and a bishopric was founded in Prague itself. It was the most important center, of course. And Boleslav II's death was followed by a period of fratricidal warfare between his sons that terminated in 1012, when the youngest son, 
Aldrich um, established himself as Prince of Bohemia. Aldrich died in 1037 and was succeeded by his son Bratislav I, uh, 1037 uh, 1055. And for the next century and a half, uh, disputes and feuds amongst members of the Premislid family hindered Bohemia's political development. Hmm. Uh, the chief source of discord being the absence of any strict law of succession to the Bohemian throne, also in here we've seen it in Poland. Um, but the problem is actually also in here the, uh, the, the absence, let's say, of a pre-existing str strongly centralized monarchy and its structures that uh, these wars in part, however, contributed to, to form, right? Also because of the concentrate the threat posed by the Germans, the other uh, enemies that uh, the Bohemians had to cope with. At, at some periods, the, the principle of seniority was observed, right? Um, which, which is kind of a sensible thing to do in general, to kind of even concentrate just a certain amount of assets and clientels in the hands of you know, a referential guide. Um, at other times, however, the deceased prince's oldest son attained uh, the throne, right? And during this period of disarray, Bohemia became uh, increasingly dependent on the Holy Roman Empire to the west, wh which is normal, as the Eastern Frankish Kingdom was essentially evolving. Even, even in Germany, as you know, the uh, decentralization of the monarchy was a very uh, slow process. It actually was never achieved. Like in Germany, mm, similarly to these other Central European powers, actually turned into an elective monarchy, but let's say that they went much closer to transforming it into a dynasty, especially in the second half of the twelfth century than than what the that this Slavic powers were were, were were doing. And the Premislid Prince Vratislav II, ten sixty one, ten ninety two, obtained from the Holy Roman Emperor Henry the Fourth the title of King of Bohemia. Uh, as a personal yet uh, in this sense, not hereditary privilege. Um, and um, the Bohemians in that case were some of the few uh, powers that intervened, if I'm not wrong, in, in favor of Henry IV against his struggles against the, the German princes and the, the, the papal excommunication. Um, eventually, Prince Vladislav II of Bohemia, uh, ruling between 1140 to 1173, was awarded the royal crown on the same basis by... Uh, Nonetheless, the Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa himself, that in this sense was trying to um, to to centralize. In fact, Frederick would be, in fact, the the, the monarch I was talking about before it went the closest to make of Germany uh, kind of a national monarchy, let's say like France or England, right? And was trying to seek the help even of of Bohemia in in terms of kind of a more um, you know, solid uh, political point of reference than instead of a more fragmented nobility to to back his own uh, imperial policy in Germany. In eleven in eleven ninety seven, Premier Ottokar the first became the undisputed overlord of the Premierslid domains, and in eleven ninety eight he was able to secure the royal title for his descendants as well as himself. Right, so here in here we go for towards essentially the dynastization, uh, and this is very important because Germany instead is trying to f is is beginning to fade, uh, and the the balances are s uh, getting s switched uh, in this sense uh, during the later Hohenstaufen period, and under premise um, Ottokar the first, um, medieval Bohemia reached the height of its economic prosperity and political prominence. Premis was succeeded by King Benceslas I, uh, ruling between 1230-1253, and the latter's son, Premis Ottokar II, 1253-1278, uh, uh, which was one of the greatest rulers of Bohemia, uh, Ottokar actually uh, was raised um, and associated to the throne to his father by this, uh, a rebellion of the of the local nobility, and he was himself very aware of, in that sense, what the dangers of the nobility 
uh, was, and during his reign he tried actually to stem, in fact, the same nobiliar power um, by founding, uh, f for example, new new cities um, uh, like uh, Teske Budejovice, I think, uh, that is, was, the, the, I think, the, the second most important center in Bohemia proper after Prague. Um, Prague flourished as well, and especially through a very cunning, intelligent, and and powerful um, foreign and domestic policy. He managed to extend his territories as far as uh, to the Adriatic Sea uh, in northeastern Italy, and in uh, including in his territories Austria, Carinthia, and Carniola. Right, and these areas were, um, in fact. Um, Let's say that there had been an, um, a vacuum of power after the extinction of the Babenberg dynasty, um, uh, the the last heirs of which uh, Ottokar married, and um, and even in these lands he backed, for example, the rights of the local cities, such as Vienna, for example, and he was committed to the wars against uh, Hungary, that were so quite expansive. But at this point, Ottokar was actually aiming at. Uh, not at the control of Germany itself, but let's say at least becoming the, the most prominent ruler uh, in the area and to have all these privileges uh, consolidated. And in, twelve, in 1278, however, he was defeated by um, Rudolf of Habsburg, uh, uh, king of the Romans that had been elected uh, in Germany and that Ottokar owed his, you know, uh, submission to uh, as a vassal of the of the would be Holy Roman Emperor, which the king of uh, king of the Romans basically was, and uh, he was defeated and died at the Battle of Markfeld, twelve seventy eight, and this was a great problem because basically Bohemia at that point lost all the territories that had accumulated under Ottokar's rule, um, and um, his expansionist let's say military campaigns were was succeeded by. Uh, by his son Wenceslas II, that however weren't as successful as the one of his father. Um, of course, th there was a, this ruler's diplomatic dexterity and great a great wealth gained f uh, for him. Uh, the crown of Poland in 1300, but he died prematurely in 1305. So he was only son Wenceslas III inherited Bohemia, but also was assassinated in. 1306 while traveling to Poland and you see here that um, here the, the the union the attempt of unifying uh, dynastically Austria Bohemia and Poland was actually a real thing uh, even the Habsburgs had nominally achieved this uh, uh, at the beginning of 14th century um, but however the assassination of Wenceslas III ended the long rule of the Permisles, uh in Bohemia, and the Bohemian throne subsequently passed to John of Luxembourg, the founder of the Bohemian branch of the Luxembourg dynasty that also would, um, in many ways, restore uh, Bohemian power in many ways. The same Charles IV um, in the, in the mid-14th century would try to essentially even re-collect uh, Ottokar II legacy in its imperialistic uh, orientation. So actually, there was a lot of continuity, but at the same time, uh, basically, Luxembourgs, the Luxembourgs were calling there even to to check the the Habsburgs, basically as princes of, of the empire and eventually as Holy Roman emperors, to to avoid this further Habsburg ex mm, threat uh, to mm, you know expansionism to threaten Bohemia. And uh, it kind of succeeded, um, in, in part, always bearing in mind that this situation was extremely, extremely fluid, also because in the Holy Roman Empire at that point, uh, there was no center anymore, practically. Like, but Bohemia actually tended, it, it remained, especially during the 14th century, the, the, the center, like in the 15th, it would kind of pass to the Habsburgs. But um, there was no real center, even within Germany. Right after the the destruction of the Ohlenstaufen, is was was basically uh, this continuous struggle between the Habsburgs, the the, the Wittelsbachs, and the the, the Wettins, all two, but also other dynasties that here we we do not discuss. We have never talked about Bohemian warfare on Schwerpunkt at this point.
Um, and there are somewhat similar patterns to the ones of Poland, except the lack of strictly kind of Eastern steps like um, direct influences, at least. Um, Bohemia is often considered like, uh, militarily speaking, a copy of the Eastern Frankish, uh, that is, German military culture. Objectively, as we've said before, uh, Westernization in Bohemia was v massive, and they were included into the, the Holy Roman Empire, institutionally speaking, and they recognized the, the, the monarchic title, as we've seen. And um, as as a Slavic power, perhaps they, they were less stratified, uh, politically and socially speaking, hence we see a consistent continuity in the use of infantry, maybe compared to the more kind of feudalized Germany that had uh, by that time gained um, a name for, especially its cavalry that was come to equate the one of France by, by the 13th and 14th centuries. And this is interesting anyhow, because Bohemia is definitely indistinguishable. I mean, it doesn't make m even much sense to try to attempt mu much the distinction uh, in this regard. And of all the, the powers that we observe today, in fact, it's the mostly, the, the most Frankicized, let's say, the most Germanized and always maintaining a, a strictly, you know, kind of Slavic character, even if with with substantial and massive German German influence and colonization that were of course incentivized by the same permissions for the sake of uh, attracting foreign communities that could counterbalance more the, the local nobility that was dangerous. Uh, Moravia also had only truth had its own kind of um, autonomistic pushes. They they even sided with the Habsburgs, for example, when uh, Ottokar II uh, engaged in warfare um, against them. So, and they rebelled, um, and and every once in a while. So, uh, these were, in in general, in the Middle Ages, in general, things were not easy for anyone in terms of political um, and administrative uh, activity. But, anyhow, passing to Hungary. Right, other very interesting chapter we never discussed thoroughly in Schwerpunkt. Um, as you know, great power ruled by the Arpad dynasty that consolidated during the 11th century with the annexation of Croatia, of Slavonia, um, and, but also in here in 1222nd, uh, uh, the Hungarian monarchy was basically obliged to recognize important privileges to the nobles, to the clergy and rural communities, and now we, we observe essentially what this uh, internal uh, balance was, was structured like. So essentially the, the final transformation of the once nomadic Magyars into a medieval kingdom of Hungary was achieved by Stephen I, ruling between 997 and 1038. Um, who at the beginning of the 11th century broke the power of the Kavars that until that time uh, had represented the nucleus of major military strength, and during his reign, the old tribal clans disappeared, right, or at least were progressively settled down, and uh, and also partly, you know, absorbing local influences. Of course, that you know the, the relation theoretically th these were peoples that of uh, that had come from 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 snaps and uh, subjugating. Um, the the local population living in the Pannonian Basin that had been m massively Slavicized, uh, so but eventually in the same Hungary Hungary retained as uh, as you know still today um, uh, not a Slavic language. So this is a tribe perhaps with this constant waves first the Avars then the uh, the the Hungars as uh, the 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 Ugar and Finnic um, base uh, for for eventually what what is today's modern modern Hungarian and um and however this is the important part because um these clans disappeared but their members continued to owe military service and their chieftains were still recognized as a warrior aristocracy but alongside these traditional leaders there were now new noblemen called the Ispans these counts um uh, chief of whom was the Nadorispan or Count Palatine, like more or less the equivalent of the Western Count Palatine, would, as the king's military deputy, perform the functions of constable.
and uh, as well as maintain their own military retinues, each ISPAN administered a specific district, leading the provincial levy of freemen in wartime, and in addition there was a Romanian voivode in Transylvania and the Slavic bands, these vice rise essentially in Croatia, Sclavonia, Dalmatia and Bosnia, uh, that interestingly enough were all ex-Byzantine uh, possessions and provinces annexed as defensive marches by the Hungarians under Bela III, uh, ruling between 1173 and 1196. And the position of Hungary is very fascinating in this context because actually um, it, it was um, really at the centers of some of the major crossroads in Europe at the time. Um, as we've seen, uh, the, the Hungarians converted to Catholicism, even though they had fallen into uh, the sphere of uh, the Byzantine Empire as well. But the German one was stronger, uh, especially after the defeat uh, uh, at Lackfeld in 955. The, the Ungers kind of looked more at the Western direction, but there were many other connections, as we will see now, e even with the Islamic world, through the uh, Danubian trade routes, and, and therefore you can find in Hungary very different, um, let's say, models, even military equipment that is kind of uh, a very fascinating mix of elements. And uh, as we were saying before, the medieval Hungarian state was very large, like it included many provinces inhabited naturally by also non major peoples, though some of these latter areas did have substantial Hungarian minorities as well. And this explains also partly the, the, the linguistical uh, you know, permanence of the major language. And many cities also included German minorities. As we noticed before, could even be described as Germanic islands set in, in a Hungarian um, uh, sea, let's say. Uh, and in fact, the Hungarian state had uh, many of the cra uh, characteristics of an empire. We have reminded before this area, Transylvania, of uh, Croatia, Sclavonia. You know, if you look at the title of Hungarian kings, the, the, it, it, it never ends. <laughs> it's extremely long because of all these possessions that were brought, sometimes, however, just nominally under its its control, right? Uh, the 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 core of the uh, of the Hungarian power would naturally the, the Pannonian basin were uh, the the majority of um, major cavalry could be levied and therefore represent this deterrent uh, against the you know the surrounding populations not to, to rise, right? Um, the most important non major regions that we have named were Transylvania that was kind of multi-ethnic, it had mixed Hungarian, Romanian, and even German population. Then there were the Zips, uh, that is would considered this area of Slovakia and uh, Ruthenia. Then Croatia, Bosnia, uh, Temesvar, that is northern Serbia, and also northern Dalmatia, all of which were essentially Slav, right? And to the east, Wallachia and Moldavia were for some time under Hungarian suzerainty too, um, but this was relatively short-lived and uh, as a result these two Vlach Romanian principalities um, would remain largely, largely autonomous even later times. And the original Hungarians or Magyars were, were nomadic people of basically finno ugrian origin, though incorporating a large Turkic or Khazar elements as well, but as well as also Indo-Europeans, telling you the truth. And after an area of intense warfare, in which the Magyars raided across much of Central Europe, um, and the Germans tried to destroy the nascent Magyar state, the Magyars suffered a major military defeat. Uh, uh, at the Battle of Blackfield, 955. Um, th this battle is important because it wasn't actually so uh, such a watershed as the same Ottonian propaganda that has been repeated uh, on actually would try to, to put. The, the pretty heavy blow had been suffered at Riade under Henry de Fowler and also by the Ottonian branch of Bavaria that actually fought for a longer time in the frontier with the Mongers sensibly weakening them and their achievements and exploit kind of 
uh, being overshadowed by Otto the First um, historiography, right? But part of the major military aristocracy was objectively slaughtered at Lechfeld by uh, the Germans, and from then on, the Magyars were gradually integrated into, you know, the not just the Christian European civilization, but to the Roman Christian, um, let's say, side, and, and not uh, from uh, Byzantium. Oh, I, I hate the term Byzantium, let's say Constantinople better. Um, and Hungary officially became Christian in um, 1001 with the accession of its first king, Stefan, right? And pre previously it had been uh, a duchy or principality. Uh, the Frankish feudal institutions were introduced and most of the elite came to adopt Western military systems and styles and while remaining on the defensive along its western borders, the new um, Christian Kingdom of Hungary started to press against its northern, southern and eastern neighbors. Uh, the reason being simply that these areas were kind of softer um, than uh, the German uh, Empire, so uh, they, the Hungarians could display kind of their uh, their power more, more effectively in there. And um, the Danubian frontier was particularly important, the, the Magyars um, had firstly occupied the central Danubian plain, as we have said, and their boundaries had rested on the crests of the Carpathians to the north, e um, east and southeast. Um, though there is a doubt about the effectiveness of Magyar control over eastern Transylvania, there probably remained actually pretty uh, autonomous power, and um, this was probably inhabited by semi-nomadic black tribes, uh, at the time, but it's the, the south um, that kind of is more important because uh, the Danube and the Sava rivers formed a, a frontier between the Hungarian, Croatian, Serbian, Bulgarian, Byzantine territories, and this area was like um, a sort of an enormous frontier since ancient times between the kind of this Central European. Uh, areas and um, of semi-nomadic populations essentially and, and the empire so there were kind of depths of hundreds of kilometers between uh, hung, uh, uh, Hungary and, and the core land of the Byzantine Empire that were hi highly militarized and where in fact the peoples like the Serbians and the Bulgarians lived and that had they were also developing in turn kind of their, their, their own autonomies and their own kind of timidly centralized structures. I mean, when I say centralized, you, have to, you don't have to think it in by, by modern standards, but kind of m medieval ones that were... But uh, th these areas were nucleating in, essentially in a perennial um, kind of warfare situation in, in lands that had uh, generally a, a low urbanization where the, 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 the political and social structures necessitated constant mobilization for... for for intervening rapidly, countering threats, uh, and eventually seizing opportunities, and, um, and therefore, th these were also extremely tough grounds, militarily speaking. Right um, from the mid 10th century, um, the Hungarians incorporated Slovakia, albeit not Moravia. Interestingly enough, in fact, uh, I mean, uh, Bohemia. And Hungary would kind of you know fight each other like hell for for centuries, um, with the Germans intervening, uh, with the Polish intervening as well. So it was a total mess in this frontier. By the way, beautiful places, naturalistically speaking, and that had all this history. That, however, left in those areas kind of a a frontier. Like this, these are lands that are not very populated and uh, that were crossed by armies for centuries and centuries in this border of warfare that naturally wasn't quite of a quite beneficial for for the local populations so it's very interesting to look at this stories like in, a, in terms of core land and surrounding areas because you see that the, the core lands never overlap and that there were you said this large frontier areas that were crossed by uh, you know that were ravaged and uh, and uh, becoming battlefields from for a very, for a very long time and uh, on the west, the Hungarian border 
substantially was the, the, the sim similar to the present Hungarian Austrian frontier, um, where it remained throughout all this period we consider today. Um, by the mid 13th century, Croatia and Dalmatia had been drawn into the Hungarian kingdom by marriage uh, alliance. And these areas were very, very, very important because they represented the only kind of consistent access to the sea for the Hungarians. Uh, unfortunately for them, the Venetians were controlling the coast and they engaged also in warfare against um, uh, the, the the Hungarians. So the, these were um, areas w which were of dramatic importance for developing kingdom because controlling the ports, uh, you could control the the, the imports, uh, the certain trade routes, and you could get you know uh, a lot of assets through that. Um, Bosnia was conquered from the Serbs, and uh, Western Wallachia lay under the uh, Hungarian suzerainty too in this period. Um, afterwards, Hungary felt uh, the full effect of Mongol invasions in 1241, you know, a pretty troubled situation. By the way, in the meanwhile, think about all the clashes uh, with, with nobility, this wasn't a stable situation at all. And the uh, the Mongol invasion was like the cherry on top. Uh, it was devastating, um, and also because the Mongols were aiming directly at the Pannonian Plain as the you know as a base of operations for raiding in in the surroundings of Europe, as you know Hungary is the the westernmost area of of the steppes, of the Eurasian steppes, um, but. Uh, this didn't happen. As you know, the Mongols withdrew, and parts of them with the Golden Ore sedent arises in what today is you know, mostly close to Russia, essentially, and the Black Sea area. And, of course, there were waves of peoples that kind of invested Hungary uh, from time to time in its eastern borders, etc. But the Carpathians would, would do as kind of a general frontier. And, um, and in fact, Hungary recovered quite quickly. Right. It was not incorporated, of course, in the Mongol Empire. And during the 14th century, the country developed into a powerful and somewhat centralized state model, um, a state, uh, thanks to the Angevins, right, that arrived there and, and modeled the monarchy almost entirely along Western lines. This time, the Angevin monarchy is literally everywhere. Um, uh, it, this French influence, as we were saying before, is quite interesting because yeah, the Angevins at this point controlled France, they controlled southern Italy, they controlled um, areas of um, of the eastern Mediterranean as well, and and they were on the thrones of Hungary, of Poland, right? Uh, you have also the French-speaking Luxembourgs in Bohemia, as we have seen it. Um, so it, it's very interesting to see how, uh, by the 14th century, also the European system is much more dynamic and capable also of encompassing all of these areas. That up, up to the few, uh, up to a few centuries ago, th these areas were fundamentally felt still as outside to, from the broader Frankish world, and now that we're starting to model essentially, essentially along its lines, and. Um, uh, Bosnia was retaken temporarily by Hungary in 1328, um, and both Wallachia and Moldo Moldavia remained under Hungarian rule under uh, until the let's say the 60s of the 14th century. So, in terms of um, military styles, that this is quite interesting as well because. The major military styles, traditionally speaking, had relied on a small tribal elite of cavalry, mostly lightly equipped horse archers, though a minority was actually in ultra-heavy armor. This was typical of the steppes, like in having an ocean of basically unarmored light archers and a uh, hyper-ultra-elite of a tiny, very tiny elite of armored knights. Right, and um, this was important, like with the, the younger invasion. And uh, in fact, tactics were basically the same one of the Eurasian steppes. Um, and uh, though in, in the version of the characteristic Western rather than Eastern steppes, in, in fact, it seems that uh, early medieval Hungary had kind of more in common, uh, militarily speaking, with um, 
regions like Iran rather than with Central Asian Turks, for example. And so bows were, and probably also because, by the way, they, they, they were kind of, pro probably they were much more Iranian, like Indo-European than Turkic in, in part, right, and in, uh, in, in the origin as well, but we don't know much about the ethnogenesis of these peoples, unfortunately. Um, and bows were also closer to the Sasanian, Caucasian, and Byzantine or early Islamic style than the, the Turkish form. Uh, as were several aspects of arm and armor, arms and armor. So this is also to to take into account. In fact, even major horse archery tactics seem to have been closer to the Middle Eastern ones than the ones of Central Asia. In addition, the early majors used quite sophisticated siege engines, right? Which also speaks for you know contacts with. Um, the, the centralized world where these engines were kind of more used because in the steppes there are no cities so you don't need any kind of engine whatsoever and and notoriously the steppes peoples kind of are kind of zero in siege warfare um, yeah the Mongols got it from China that, that's how they became actually the masters of siege warfare that's another story and and culturally um, you know speaking you know culture as well as trade contacts with the Islamic world in Hungary were in fact very important, especially during the 10th and 11th century, right? Um, because at that moment, actually, the Islamic world had uh, also the upper hand in trade balance. So actually, uh, from the Danube Black Sea, the, the Hungarians could reach those uh, trade routes, just like in the north, the Varangians were, were doing um, up to the Caspian Sea, etc. Um, so... There is an intense phase of westernization of their tactics between the 10th and the 12th century, and this probably affected well, also the, the royal household, mercenary troops, and the leading barons. And some sections of major society, particularly in the Great Plain, remained tribal, and at least transhumant, if not strictly nomadic, well into the 12th century. Right, and objectively, you know, think that it's not that Hungary was a particularly you know developed place historically speaking. I mean, and they. they um, these lands were not encompassed by the Roman Empire, if not in the West, and th th those were strictly militarized frontiers with a few urbanization, and the Pannonian Plain was mostly a good place for, in fact, for grazing uh, for these uh, swarms of um, stamped peoples rather than for, for a sedentary society. Then you have to go a bit further south in regions like Masia and the, the Middle Danube to have uh, some agri agriculture consistently developed, but as we've seen in there also, there was a militarized frontier, and the lands were ravaged uh, as well. So, you, you know, th these geographical aspects are kind of interesting as well, uh, in terms of environment, I mean, and agricultural potential. Um, but, in the Kingdom of Hungary, of course, the majority of the population, especially in the Slavic areas had always been agricultural, right? Um, so, because, so, you know, uh, al along the, uh, around the, the Pannonian basin, you're still seeing all the kind of sedentarized populations at this point, uh, the Majors being essentially the, the exception. Um, so, as a consequence, obviously the Majors settled down themselves and um, increasing in turn feudalization of the country and of the army in light cavalry um, however it does not disappear um, it kind of decreases in importance but it was refueled every once in a while by settling down uh, certain peoples of the steppes under the Hungarian um, crown um, many refugees from the Mongol invasions, for, for example, notably the Kumans at one point, actually they, the Hungarian royals, even uh, the Arpads intermarried with the, with the same, this Kuman nobility. Um, and, and, and Kuman archers being found prominently in Hungarian armies, right, which you don't find uh, much um, elsewhere, especially in the northern, northwestern Slavic area. Um, and uh, in terms of the elite, like probably uh, at a common, like at the middle class level, there were more ethnic continuities, even in panoply with the old step tradition. But the the Hungarian elite um, 
uh, was it kept at this point in uh, essentially largely or or even entirely Western European fashion. And the process of military westernization is more apparent in the uh, Slavic provinces of the Hungarian Kingdom where arms, armor and military traditions had uh, never ceased to be in fact within the wider European tradition as we have observed for Bohemia and Poland before. And by the 12th century Hungary was making use of Balkan troops drawn from areas which had been under Western European influence since Carolingian times and despite a considerable major impact the military traditions of the northern Carpathian mountains also remained in fact essentially Western. Uh, the same process can be observed uh, also during the 13th and 14th century. Um, by then, the traditional or step elements had been revived, as we have observed by the these large numbers of Kuman or Kipchak refugees into Hungary at the time of the Mongol invasions. Nevertheless, the dominant feudal nobility were almost indistinguishable from their German or Italian counterparts and as were, of course, German settlers and German Teutonic Knights in such areas as Transylvania. Transylvania had a strong um, German colonization, uh, as we know, and Hungary also was close to, um, to, to northern Italy. It was basically the, the single most important armory center of production in Europe at the time. So even you know, for all the, the centuries of low and late medieval times, you can find... Uh, Italian armor being bought in Hungary and being worn even in places as far as you know the Romanian knights would would have such such thing uh, as well. So um, progressively, in the, you you can see, especially at the time of the arrival of the Ottomans, Hungary as a almost completely westernized country as well in military culture. Um, and of course, Hungary's long experience of warfare against the nomads from the steppes just across across the Carpathian Mountains probably accounted for a continued employment of quantities of relatively lightly armored horse archers of various origins. Of course, um, the 13th century Hungarian army had, for example, many characteristics in common with Byzantine forces for this reason. Um, uh, infantry crossbowmen played some part albeit most of these troops came from Slavic areas such as Slovakia, um, and the crossbow rapidly became popular uh, in, the, in the Hungarian kingdom, albeit by the 15th century it had not managed to um, oust the composite handbow that was traditional of Hungarian warfare. Um, and the Hungarians used um, other tactics that are associated uh, with the one of the western Eurasian steppes. For example, um, the wagons thrown up to form field fortifications, although uh, this particular idea uh, may have never actually faded uh, in the same logistical practices of many armies. Actually, the Poles did it at one point. The Bohemians are also mostly famous for them in, in the 15th century. Um, there are many so-called oriental features seen uh, in late Hungarian armies that um, later on are, are explained um, also by this content, for example, with the rising Ottomans in the Balkans, but uh, objectively the Hungarians rarely met uh, with the Ottomans face to face until the late 14th century, so um, probably such characters of kind of Eastern influence were pre-existing in this um, area in, in the north of the, Bal north of the Balkans that had continued to receive kind of um, steps, inputs from, from the east, uh, etc. Um, and the um, eventually, we, we stop here because there would be a lot to say, even for, especially of 14th and 15th century Hungarian warfare, but we, uh, we stop it now. And we pass to Bulgaria. Um, Bulgaria, as we were saying before, reconquers at this point uh, its independency from Constantinople in 1187 and it reaches its uh, apogee under the reign of Ivan Asen II between 1218 
1241. And uh, the, the area was occupied, as we know, by the Byzantines as far back as 1018. Uh, Bulgaria only regained its independency, as we've seen in the 80s of the 12th century, with, uh, with this revolt that brings to the foundation of the Bulgarian kingdom of Tornovo. Uh, that is today referred uh, as more useful to the second as to the second second Bulgarian Empire, right from the first one of the early Middle Ages, um, and this was in fact um, kind of more like, of course, Bulgaria had been conquered by the Byzantines, not not quite completely actually. Um, these were lands over which uh, Constantinople left uh, by large kind of a autonomous administration uh, even after the defeat against Basil uh, the second nicknamed Bulgaroctonus um, in fact as the slaughterers of, of the Bulgars uh, the Bulgarians at that point um, the you know the great part of Bulgarian nobility had actually remained were at its place of course certain lands were occupied and also uh, incorporated into the Byzantine provinces um, so the the picture is kind of I admit I don't know much about this, but I, I suggest that you know you know the the first Bulgarian Empire of course had been a, a power of of, some, of more than some consistency you know they they had um, essentially tried to to force their own um, presence into the the institutional mechanisms of of, of the Byzantine Empire to to kind of Concord participate to the imperial uh, dignity, and of course the Byzantines from one side considered them as just subjects. The, the Bulgarians thought of themselves to be equals, if not superiors, to the Byzantines. And the truth is that even if, of course, the Bulgarians eventually were defeated by by the Byzantines, uh, they represented quite of a problem for a very long time, extremely close to Constantinople, and actually. Um, pro possibly the largest one, even even more than the Muslim one, at, in, in those centuries uh, along the eastern frontier. Um, so in the Balkans, uh, this power had had the chance to kind of strengthen, had started this uh, form of sedentarization, also exploiting, of course, um, the um, you know the occupation of formerly controlled Byzantine territory that, however, in the previous centuries had been kind of Slavicized and in part basically lost to the same direct control of the Byzantines. You know, here the, the concept is somewhat complicated, but let's say that the, the areas of, of, of lack of trace where the Bulgarians had settled, um, had developed largely, um, were that they were not unknown to civilization. They were surely more advanced than they, than, I don't know, Poland had, what was it this time, or, um, or Russia. But um, this power had not, however, succeeded in giving itself a continuity. Like with the defeat of 1018, uh, that work that was also kind of a good one had been started by the Tsars of Bulgaria uh, was, was lost. Right, So they, they reverted back to subject peoples in some form, even if, with, with all of its autonomies. Um, so what we find in the 12th century is a revival, actually, of a Bul bulgaro vlak kuman alliance, right? These were more people together. It wasn't just the, Bul uh, the, Bulgar the Bulgarians. And actually, it seems that the Vlachs, that is, the, the Valachians, um, predominated uh, under the leadership of three brothers, Peter, also known as Kalopeter, Tsar of the Vlachs, and most a part of the Bulgarians, this title held between 1185 and 96. Then Asen died in 1196, and Kaloyan, or also known as uh, Yon Nitsa, Tsar between uh, 1197 and 1207, who styled themselves as Romayoktonos, right? So this the slayer of the Romans, like Basil had uh, was nicknamed the actually slayer of the Bulgarians. This was kind of the response, actually, probably Basil. It w was called like this. It was never an official title. Many people think that, you know, it, Basil II would have had normally, like all the Roman emperors at that point, the the, the official title of Porfirio Genetos, right? And Slayer of the Bulgarians was kind of a nickname adopted later by later historiography, right? But this singly, of course, from the Bulgarians was seen in the other side because objectively uh, these populations had 
suffered, of course, of uh, of the, the the defeat and it knew what what it had costed. Um, and the um, the origins of the Vla um, Bulgar Black Kuman Alliance date back to at least the late 10th century uh, because the the Bulgarians ha had actually kept rebelling to Byzantine rule that had been several once especially in fact in the seventh half of the of the 11th century and Anna Komnena describes at the time the Vlachs as um, leading nomadic lives among the Bulgars and guiding the Kumans through Balkan mountain passes to fight against the Byzantines. So this is very interesting because it's, you know, that there is this northern Wallachian component that, as you know, it's uh, somewhat different from the surrounding Transylvania and, uh, um, and um, it's um, essentially uh, also a separated element from the Bulgarians, right? That essentially joined so as kind of a leading element with the Bulgarians and m making pouring through Kumans from, from the steppes, right? Um, these were all peoples, by the way, that had f kind of fought together. I mean, even during the, Bul the First Bulgarian Empire, you realized that, you know, the core land, or the heartland of the Bulgarians inf was in fact Bulgaria and certain other parts of the Balkans. But they extended their, their authority, uh, authority um, you know, that they had projection capabilities that went as far as the border with the Carolingian Empire in the Pannonian Plain, right? But the peoples that inhabited all around were somewhat autonomous, and of course, especially in the in the in the Carpathian Mountains, that those were areas that fundamentally, yeah, they were subjected to the Bulgarians, but you know, the hell went there to, you know, to force too much the hand. This was these were. On, on their outskirts, forcefully decentralized governments, and this was the reality, the political reality all over. You can say all over Europe, uh, by by many standards. Um, so, uh, but it's very interesting that there was a kind of a joint um, participation of several tribal elements, which definitely the Bulgarian ones by now represented kind of the more advanced because they were already. You know, evilly influenced, influenced by the same Byzantines, they had had their own, um, in fact, administrative political traditions on their own. So they they were some somewhat a consen consistent power, but seemingly the, the major force, the ma major military, because also the Bul Bulgars had sedentarized and kind of um, similarly to what happened to the the Angers with the Slavic populations, right? You know, in fact, in today's Bulgaria, it's not even like Hungary. They speak kind of graphic language. They they speak Slavic, right? So um, in that case, the, the, even the sedentarization brought to to a sort of gentrification, even the same Slavic population had contact with the empire. Instead, the blacks, as we've seen, were kind of still semi-nomadic, and the Kumans even nomadic, basically. And these were still the, you know, the the, the tribal, the, the most warlike, agitated, and turbulent um, peoples that wanted to push against the Byzantine Empire. That at that time wasn't faring that well, right? Um, they were in the second half of the 12th century. Um, uh, especially, in fact, when the uh, the Second Bulgarian Empire is is born, um, kind of having a lot of problems, especially against the Normans, uh, they were also hammering them from the south. They had conquered, uh, even seized at least Thessalonica, etc. So, um, eventually, in 1204, as you know, the empire would even uh, be conquered by by the Latins. So, um, during, uh, for example. The aftermath, in fact, of the Fourth Crusade, um, uh, Villardouin and uh, Robert de Clary repeatedly refer to Bulgarian armies by such expression as a great host of Cumans, Greeks, and Vlako Bulgarians. Right. So they identify these elements. Like at this point, especially after the Fourth Crusade, you you find here the Greek element. And why? Because these were evidently Byzantines that had. Um, been ousted, they had uh, fled the empire after the crusader conquest and had joined the Bulgarians as well that were now kind of Vlako Bulgarians as a broader alliance and plus there's Kumans that could be found by the way um, basically everywhere like in all of these powers as mercenaries and uh, the, the Byzantines made a, a massive 
extensive use of Kuman uh, horse archers as mercenaries. I even made a video about Byzantine auxiliaries now in which I discussed that. Like the the standard light horse archers would be in the Byzantine army at that point would be Kumans or basically troopers I styled in identical military costume to Kumans, right? Um, and uh, and at, at this point, by the way, also exploiting this um, instability in the Balkans after the the collapse of the empire, to to actually launch raids into into the same Balkans, and this arrived to hit as far as of course as Turkey, um, as da down into Greece, um, and uh, the, it was a a freaking mess. Right, but there were still these elements, like in fact, uh, uh, Wallachia, Bulgaria, then Serbia, and uh, and various Latin um, f feudal chunks. Let's say that were uh, kind of struggling for the control of of the southern Balkans. Um, and and the armies of of these uh, Vlako bulgarian power were actually large. They they seemingly were several thousands strong, especially I would say tanks to the Kuman light archers could be found in extremely large numbers very easily because they were kind of cheap and they had to operate in, en masse and um, these were normally the, the army as a whole would, were cavalry with of course kind of heavier type from the Vlako-Bulgarian element that were strongly Byzantinized in material culture of course and also speared armed infantry provided by those cities of Thrace and Macedonia that um, were reconquered at that time from the Latin Empire of uh, of the so-called Romania, right? Um, so mm, we see that in fact the Second Bulgarian Empire starts encompassing territories that had formerly belonged to the Byzantine Empire itself, and that now the Latin Empire was not capable of, of controlling anymore. And after Kaloyan, the Bulgarian Empire's only other notable ruler, um, and a hell of a ruler, though, was even Asin II, uh, between, ruled between 1218-41. Wu um, was a great ruler that achieved, we could spend a lot of time talking even about, I don't know, the cultural achievements of the Second Bulgarian Empire. It was a Kind of a very interesting entity. Uh, militarily speaking, we remember even Asin II's victory over the Byzantines of uh, Epirus at Kolotnitsa in 1230. Maybe one day we will talk about the battle, um, where the despot of Epirus was captured, right? And uh, as a consequence, even Asin II proclaimed himself to be lord of all the lands between Adrianople to um, Durazzo in Albania, um, declaring that even the Latin Empire of Romania was under his sway, because he said, only allegedly, uh, only thanks to me do they survive. And there, there was this feeling, objectively, that, um, yes, that... Um, that the the Bulgarian the second Bulgarian Empire was the the, the lar you know the larger regional power uh, in the area, um, and that you know managed to to encompass several territories that were objectively now the the major threat to whoever was was present around. Um, and however, after even Asin the Second's death. The Bulgarian Empire began a slow decline that would finally end um, in half of a millennium of Turkish occupation beginning at the end of the 14th century. Um, and there would be maybe else to say about the, the local military culture, but it, it's actually very complicated because um, the world picture is very fragmented. Today I, I talk about Bulgaria because... I thought, I don't know, we don't talk about it very often, but as we were saying before, we could concentrate more uh, even on other powers. We could concentrate on Serbia, we could concentrate on the same. Uh, but um, for today, we I, I think it was 
interesting because it, it's a power that you know everybody remembers the, the first Bulgarian Empire. Actually, the second empire is pretty important as well. In its, uh, it was very important and also for the uh, revival of the same Byzantine Empire of the role. Uh, eventually, um, the the story actually is much more. Com Today, I just listed a couple of rulers, but the story is very complicated and very fascinating. Even Bulgarian warfare, we will have to talk about it more in detail. You know that I make all these videos, kind of, um, uh, you know, this one as I was saying before is kind of a, a synthesis. But we will observe uh, every military context. Yesterday, we talked, for example, about 13th century. He, uh, Polish heavy infantrymen, right? We will talk about, I don't know, 13th century Bulgarian uh, knight. We will do it, right? Uh, so stick around and we will get to that. Um, so I would pass actually to Russia now, which is kind of the most complicated uh, of all these areas um, because it's objectively more messed up and larger and uh, it's um, and there are the major changes in here uh, messed up I mean in the sense that um, it was not a unitary element so it, it would require kind of better focus on all the various powers here so you know that around the 9th century the Eastern Slavs had penetrated into the great plants between the Danube and the Don River um, so around the Black Sea so settling in essentially today's Ukraine and the surrounding regions and contemporarily from Scandinavia uh, there were certain groups of traders and uh, warriors um, that had settled around along the same uh, Russian rivers um, in, in the north that and, and that the Slavic populations called as the Rus that w means the ro uh, rowers, if I'm not wrong, that actually th was defining the, the Vikings as, as such, because these were objectively kind of um, troops of, uh, they were military bands of mercenaries, of pi pirates, etc. And uh, it was a, a chief of theirs, allegedly Oleg, that in um, 882 unified the northern principality of Novgorod with the southern one of Kiev. These were the most important centers at the time, uh, in the opposite north and south of Russia, respectively. That, however, gave life to, in fact, the Kievan Rus, or simply Rus, uh, as Kiev uh, was the, the major uh, center, trade center, was, you know, well put, well placed, uh, kind of closer to the Black Sea, in context with Constantinople, and still getting this. Um, communications with the North, the Baltic Sea, and all the, the the trade that switched also between East and West, because the Varangian trade actually reached as far as Ca the Caspian Sea, the Islamic world, uh, etc. And this entity that I I don't I I don't even know how to call the Kievan Rus. It's not a kingdom proper because it's th there were several um, principalities. It was a principality actually in itself, meaning that Kiev um, also. Um, uh, as we will see now, God Christianized became the, the the center of the Russian Church. So, actually, the, the religious element was a very important gluing factor for all these principalities, uh, aside from the um, perceived common descendancy from the R Rurikid dynasty that had founded this allegedly. But these are myths, right? We we don't know very much about what happened. But let's say that there was a a, a sense of shared. Um, of commonality shared by the various ruling class that allegedly belong to all the same uh, fa extended family, right? And the actually historiography has showed how, the, in, in spite you know the, uh, that the importance of the 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 Viking element in Russia that helped to catalyze these. A local resource into a kind of a more centralized fashion, etc. Um, the Kievan Rus is largely not a Viking but a Slavic uh, power. Like it was if objectively Slavic elites that paid these merc Viking mercenaries and made them and surely intermarried uh, with them, um, uh, with the nobility becoming, yeah, kind of Slavic Varangian, Slavic Scandinavian, whatever you want to call them. But let's say still. 
pertaining to this broader Slavic area that, by the way, was, wasn't very homogeneous by itself. Like, we have troubles, as we will see now, even to determine, you know, what is Russia, geographically speaking, at this point, because we, we are not sure, especially about the Eastern Frontier, what, what it actually was. Um, and um, the the same Varangians eventually were kind of Slavicized, and under Vladimir the uh, First, ruling between 980 and 1051, who also married the sister of the Byzantine Emperor Basil II, uh, converted to Christianity 988. So this opened. Uh, this is the major uh, element here of importance, probably. Um, Russia to the influence of Byzantine civilization and of Orthodox liturgy. Um, and with Yaroslav the Wise between 1016 and 1054 that um, collected uh, the, I mean, that wrote down actually the, uh, the oral um, costumes uh, of, of the Russian people, in fact, in a legal code. Um, the Kievan Rus reached the apex of its power and it, ex it extended up to control the great uh, roads of, of trade between the, the Baltic, Europe and in the East. Right? And, and this means a lot of, of surplus and resources that were accumulated in the hands of the Rus that at this point were actually a, a massive power. We don't know much about them telling the truth because they're kind of faraway lands. They uh, they, they weren't terribly advanced uh, as such. I mean, they they didn't left much of a mark, but th this was a big thing, wh whatever it was, and we know that they managed to knock out, I don't know, for example, even the Khazars and to, to counter successfully the, the, the nomadic, nomadic troop, um, let's say, peoples up to the Mongol invasion, etc. And uh, there was this, uh, you know, looming, mm, let's say, ideal of uh, say of of, um, of unifying the whole Kievan Rus ideally right um, there was an extreme attempt by Vladimir II between 1113 and 1115 uh, in order to give u back unity to to a domination that however now had fundamentally mm, uh, come couldn't come back from this process of division into several principalities that also was it went in parallel with the decline of the same Kievan Rus, right? And from the uh, beginning of the 13th century, we know that uh, was formed in the uh, Asian steppes this enormous uh, domination uh, by hand of the nomadic tribes originary of Mongolia, guided by Temujin, uh, living between 1162 and, and 1227. Um, known as Genghis Khan, that this universal lord, um, uh, thanks to whom the Mongols conquered rapidly northern China, Central Asia, and eastern Russia, thanks to their armies and their discipline, logistics, um, and the successors operated, uh, as we know, incursions towards the Muslim countries up to Egypt and convert, uh, converting largely to Islam and managing to destroy Baghdad in 1258, which was a massive change. So uh, in Europe, the impact of the Mongols, were, that were also called Tatars, um, or Tartars, um, you know, they, they launched this m massive offensives, like for, for the Mongols they were just like the outskirts of, of the world, like sending this normal invasions. For, for Europe it was like traumatizing in great part, but at the same time Eur Europe had a thick skin at this time. They, they, they managed to absorb the Mongols that ob objectively didn't continue on with, with the invasion of Europe, they probably didn't quite even, they didn't even care much about, and I'm of the opinion especially that they if had they gone on, they would have bogged down in, in into Germany, but not much because of the um, any particular better fighting skill. I mean, the, the Mongols, you know, annihilated German Polish armies, the Hungarian armies, you know, the the Russian armies, right? So, so in much of uh, terms of European tactical sophistication, but simply because this massive. Um, 
Mongol armies and all their logistics would have to stop at every single damn stinky castle in Central Europe, and that would have been kind of senseless. Um, anyhow, we, we have observed how they um, reached in 1240, 1231 up to Poland, to Silesia and Hungary, uh, they actually even crossed the Alps at one point in their, some of their detachments. They threatened directly Vienna uh, in Austria and they, they arrived up to the Adriatic Sea. Um, so from the mid-13th century, the, the Mongols, however, had began to, to kind of withdraw because of the rivalries were always more um, um, heathened by, between their own chiefs and the enormous empire that extend, uh, stretched from Korea to, to Persia to the borders of Poland was split into the Khanates and Russia was the European land that was hit the hardest um, and also ba about this like we don't know much first of all because the Mongols objectively destroyed much themselves but also because we, we don't you know, these, those lands didn't produce much of a documentation as such. That many of them were still very relatively primitive. But whatever happened in Russia, it was a nightmare. And um, we know that Russian society was restructured from the very roots by Mongol invasions, were radically altered, whatever had existed in there. Um, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, um, pre-Mongol Russia albeit declining and already kind of stratifying uh, politically and socially speaking, was still theoretically characterized by all these big trade centers along the Russian rivers with a, with a kind of, you know, urban commonality uh, of communities of traders and merchants that occasionally even managed with their town militia to counterbalance the power of the, um, of the Russian princes, like with the, the nobility. Um, after the Mongol invasions, Russia is literally, and I mean this, like I made a playlist about Russian history in which I explained this thing in, at length, uh, they became literally an identical copy of the Mongols. And I'm not kidding. Like, of course, you know, the Russians were kind of still Slavic, center, more centralized than the Mongols, but, you know, if you, in the 14th century, you look at a Golden Horde army and a R Russian one, and you'll go on in time. I mean, they're literally the same thing. There's not even a single difference. Maybe the Russians had still a bit this town militias scattered in the forests, in places like even as Mo Moscow, that you know was also one of the minor Russian cities, was actually one probably one of the smallest principalities. Um, but for the rest, they were identical, and these were eff effectively client states of the Mongols, and nothing else. And they were bred into Mongol political and military theory, and that's what the, also the rise of the Muscovy stems from. So, uh, the point here is that even the, the internal balance of Russia had completely reshifted. Like, after the destruction of Kiev in, in 1240, for almost two centuries, the Slavic principalities were tributaries of the Khanate of the Golden Horde. Um, the uh, the seat of the Russian church had shifted from Kiev to Vladimir, and from there on it would be uh, it would remain there, and eventually would be bought by Moscow um, later on. Um, and the the Khanate of the Golden Horde had w was this repetition, you know, there were the various hordes that eventually settled. They had uh, these different colors. Um, the Golden Horde was settled into this area on... Um, its capital was Sarai, on the lower Volga River. And and it basically Russia, and this is the concept I care very much about, it was basically detached from, from the rest of Europe this time. Like, they had... They were drawn into the steppes orbit rather than in the European one. Um, so, that increase of... You know, Eastern character in in, in the East was was brutal. Ex uh, let's say it was a brutal acceleration of the Easternization of Russian political and military culture. Whereas instead, doesn't matter whether Lithuania or Poland or Hungary were resented of Mongol influence, that those still stuck to the West and were w fully Westernized by the uh, 
um, by the end of the uh, of like maybe Lithuania not so much Lithuania did resemble a bit more of Russia but as we've seen Poland Bohemia Hungary were fully kind of you know uh, part of the, of the Western um, say what would be the Frank the evolution of Frankish feudalism etc. So the, the history of Russia in, in this period is dramatic. We will not extend into low and uh, late medieval Russia as we will stick now, as we've seen between like the tenth and the the thirteenth centuries in this video. Um, and as I was saying before, I also made videos about the late Middle Ages, the rise of Moscovy, etc. You can see it in the medieval Russia playlist. Um, talking a bit more in detail about Russia is, is kind of complicated because. Albeit it was vast by the standards of medieval Europe, it was a land, um, it was not particularly big, where compared to, for example, Eurasian nomad states, which were its southern and southeastern neighbors, right? The the reason being, of course, that th these were more like a sanitary power, so even the nominal rule was kind of more limited to certain areas and of course they, they were in part of even better structured than others. That's why they managed to defeat some of them before the Mongol invasion and kind of proficiently. Um, so the first principality of Russia as we have seen emerged in, in the 10th century partly as a result of Scandinavian penetration along the great rivers and partly as an offshoot of the state which um, the nomadic Turkish Khazars had established in the western steppes. It was a um, a land of forests and woodland, while the south were open steppes, which continued to be dominated by nomadic peoples of essentially Central Asian military culture. Um, and the, mm, let's say, the, the extent to which Russia dominated the far northern forests and tundras um, is basically unknown, but it seems that Mm, um, you know, at least the borders with Hungary, Poland, and the Baltic peoples were somewhat clear, right? Though often shifting because they were unstable, but th those were fully sedentarized peoples and were developing, as we've seen, their own um, their own social structure, uh, put, um, their institute, territorial dominations, like on a monarchical base. Um, medieval Russia Eastern Frontier was. Um, it's not even probably even doesn't make much sense to to talk about one right um these uh, slav russians were gradually colonizing the river valleys um in a region previously inhabited by the more backward and certainly more thinly spread finnogarian tribes like the slavs had a powerful demographic strength right they they, they managed to like they were a, a tide, they 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 they, they invested in enormous areas during the migration era um, and Slavicizing them fairly easily. Also because, in fact, there were a few people uh, in the places where they migrated, so th that uh, that's why ethnically they were more impacting in certain areas. Um, and basically, uh, also, in fact, th there weren't many other centers, if not certain kind of trade ones. For example, the only cities that the Slavs, kind of, uh, the, the Russians invested at this point were um, the one of the Volga Bulgars that were making a lot of money through uh, the Volga trade, uh, force and slaves, and and, um, the, and and this power laid in the middle Volga and Kama basins, and um, and this was a Turkic is, uh, Islamic state. Right, it was somewhat more sophisticated in most respects to the same Russian state, but well, even this is somewhat debatable. And b however, between the 10th and the 13th century, uh, Russia's eastern frontier ran from the the Dnieper River, um, southeast of Kiev, uh, in a roughly northeasterly line towards the Upper Kama River, and a virtually under undefined frontier then seems to have continued in a north easterly direction towards the Arctic Ocean, right? And in this far-flung territories, the relatively peaceful Ugra, Vyatka, Chud, and Samoyed tribes might have um, at some points recognized Russian suzerainty, or at least um, they would have dealt, surely, 
with Russia for trade, especially for trade. Um, and during this period, uh, the following periods of the centralization of the Russians, um, you you basically never get to a moment in which this territory was unified. Like the the, the Eastern Slavic tribes had simply expanded there, and they started structuring kind of certain centers that, you know, were they're actually pretty numerous uh, because as we've seen, this territory was pretty pretty extended. Um, but they were m mutually hostile principalities. The greatest ones were, as we've seen, Kiev, um, Sutsdal, Vladimir, Smolensk, Chernigov, Polotsk, uh, Galicia in, the, in southwest, Volhynia, and the city-state of Novgorod in the north that was kind of more reminiscent of, um, I don't know, Anseatic League cities than and actually a Russian city, because it was made uh, uh, really a, a merchant republic, right? Um, Kiev exercised nominally seniority over the other principalities uh, until the sack by the Mongols under Batu in 1240. And as we have hinted at before, this state of matters uh, originated from the fact that the Russian lands were originally inherited by um, a sort of rota system, and l then later by the equally un unworkable appanage system, whereby on his death, uh, prince lands were divided amongst all his sons, and inevit inevitably, uh, such a system of subdivision, as we've seen also in Poland and in other areas, could generate a plethora of petty states, right? Ever decreasing in size with each generation, so that on the wall only a fratricidal civil war uh, could uh, maintain some kind of worthwhile uh, size uh, for these principalities. And indeed, nearly half of the period between. Uh, the mid 11th century and the Mongol invasion of 1223 was spent in interesting uh, warfare, right? These um, appanages were um, met, uh, called as udeli, seemingly, in, in, which means portions, and um, some of them were um, fairly small, actually, uh, I each army um was drawn up by putting all these elements together and in terms of strictly sp r speaking of russian warfare um during this period uh think about what also how the terrain of russia influenced uh, the local armies think about forests marshes and rivers right so as we have seen also in the von Clausewitz playlist uh, series um we, you know, the ground is the protagonist of every military development in many ways. And according to many sources, uh, in the 10th century, the Russian armies had originally a pretty consistent infantry, right? Which is typically Slavic. Uh, and they were also even well equipped. So this means that they were a strong middle class that also could afford a good. Uh, gear, uh, in seemingly in almost Byzantine style, and these large infantry forces survived as also the Voi peasant levy um, that we can find between the 11th and 13th century. Uh, there was also widespread use of archery by such infantry, um, seemingly using simple long bows, but also large semi-composite bows covered in birch bark. Um, that m m bark that might indicate actually Scandinavian rather than Byzantine influence, uh, even in the region of Kiev, right? Uh, albeit, actually, this area was a melting pot of of uh, several um, military cultures, also, and especially the steppes ones, actually, probably being underestimated, even for the Russians that, of course, began to develop this further. Uh, especially with the development of, uh, especially of horse, um, large 
mounted retinues of the princely um, houses, let's say. And ultimately, um, it seems that more important than both Byzantine and early Scandinavian influence, in fact, was that of the military sophisticated nomadic peoples of the Eurasian steppes, right? Um, it seems, in fact, that um, there was a competition that the Russians were having with the, the, the peoples of the steppes that made their equipment evolving in a essentially in a different direction with the one of Western Europe. Like, while the, the Poles or the Bohemians or the Hungarians were struggling to fight against German cavalry, um, on the Frankish model, the, uh, the the Russians were fighting against the Eurasian steppes peoples, and you can see um, a lot. For example, lamellar armor being used, which doesn't mean that it wasn't used elsewhere. Like you can find lamellar armor even in Sweden, or even Poland, or as we've seen before, and or even in you know in other places that you would in the Mediterranean, of course. But just for saying that in Russia it seems prominent, and and because of this contact with, with Eastern peoples, and uh, of course even contact with the Byzantines themselves that had, the, in their military culture, were massively influenced by the steppes warfare. Um, um, it seems in fact at the same time in this centuries, composite bows were adopted, at least in some parts of Russia, um, together with the curved saber, which was known among the Eastern Slavs at least um, uh, at the tenth century, though this weapon was somewhat rare beyond s the southern frontier zones for many centuries. Actually, uh, the saber wasn't so widespread as we we think at this time. Many um, many peoples of the steppes um, um, gravitating, for example, uh, around the Black or Caspian seas were. Uh, influenced more by an Iranian tradition of straight swords, etc. The, you know, the, the, the thing arrived later, especially with the Mongols and the Tartars, seemingly that the sa saber became kind of uh, mainstream, or at least more widely um, used. Um, but uh, on this, th there would be a lot to discuss, actually, because it's very complicated as a topic how and why certain types of swords, especially in that context, kind of develop, because we, we don't clearly also understand the, w the whole picture, uh, cent for cent. Uh, it, it's not that simple as saying, oh, well, the saber is curved, therefore it's good for horse uh, combat. You can't say that, because there were peoples that were steps peoples and before didn't use that, so uh, it's not just um, simply physical technological matter about the sword. It, there is much more to it, including progress, probably collective training needs and also needs of mass production. It, it depends. It depends on training times. And it's, it's complicated. But we will, not, we will discuss it on another occasion. Um, the, um, what is interesting at this point is that Russia, given its trade uh, power also began to export its own military style and equipment, right? Um, this mostly happened towards Northern and Central Europe in the late 10th and 11th century, and um, as well as the Bol Volga Bulgars, uh, 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 the Volga Bulgars in the 12th and 13th century, and other neighboring lands. Um, as we've seen. Um, Kiev was the dominating southern city of of Russia, and and it seems that it, it was in fact legitimately also the, the most highly developed Russian uh, military force, um, even after the the fragmentation of Kievan Russia, the further fragmentation at least in the following centuries, and mm, some think that th there can, in fact, that there was this massive Scandinavian Viking influence that created that military, but uh, as we as we have observed, even Teodor wrote about this um, extensively, you know, there was much, much more sound Slavic base to this. The, um, the, core, the professional core of the Kievan Rus army were the Druzhina, uh, 
uh, of the uh, Slavic nobility that soon developed these heavy cavalry techniques that probably reflect, especially Byzantine contact, especially at the beginning uh, of this period, like the Byzantines were on the lead in cavalry, te you know, in equestrian technology, uh, warfare, let's say, and um, they were making school all around, and uh, probably the Slavs already had their own, by that time, a mounted uh, tradition that maybe we can't trace so so clearly, but that wasn't that heavy uh, like it developed uh, afterwards. Like, there are in fact similar developments that we have observed it before in Poland or in Bohemia, and even in Hungary. Um, during the 12th and, and 13th century, uh, 13th century, in fact, the heaven, the wagoning of uh, the Kievan Rus cavalry uh, was more evident. Uh, swords and, and spears were the ba basic cavalry uh, weapons, and it seems at this time, uh, even town, uh, town militias, uh, urban militias, uh, adopted the crossbow, hmm? uh, which is important because it's also a kind of anti-cavalry weapon, and you always have to think, in pre-Mongol times, this country, forever ongoing contrast between the uh, the elites, uh, the princely elites and the urban classes that kind of struggled for power. Um, there were also in the Kievan army uh, subordinate nomadic tribes that participated, usually they were called in the 13th century as black hats. Um, these were mostly horse archers and they were essential for fighting, especially against other steppes peoples, and uh, they seemingly were famous also for these face mask helmets that are associated generally also with the Black Hat's name, but also naturally with the Islamic Middle Eastern tradition of uh, Eurasian uh, steppe origin of wearing masks for the face, which is typically equestrian uh, need, um, and um and and there is a, a also seemingly an increased development of our importance in archery over time like you know, mounted archery in the russian army even before in fact the mongol invasion which is o obvious if you think about it considering the neighbors that the russians had found there um and there were naturally other influences even objectively also of scandinavian origin but the Kievan Rus uh, Russian warfare was largely locally developed, we can't say. The Kievan tactics largely evolved, in fact, as well, in response to threat posed by horse archery. Um, there was this solid core of foot soldiers in the center of formations with spearmen using a shield wall to protect infantry archers while cavalry held the flanks. So the importance of infantry is in anti-cavalry function in this sense is confirmed also by uh, Polish warfare as we have seen yesterday and uh, by the development of certain particular types of shields that were kind of more effective for defending from projectile fire mostly rectangular form and pretty large that were typical at this point it, between all between the, the the western slavs the eastern slavs and the southern slavs um we we don't we can't trace clearly what um you know th these developments kind of uh, uh, um, transformed like but we're pretty sure that probably the these designs that were present in there like in, in uh, around certain eras since the ancient world telling you shit uh were revived, um, functionally speaking, because probably of the contact of this sedentary Slavic element with the the horse archery of the steppes, right? Uh, but the Slavs now are developing cavalry as well, and horse archers as well uh, with them. Um, uh, Kevin armies were also pretty large. Carts and wagons were part, vital part of their, their logistics, and they also served in that kind of Fortif field fortification manner that was typical of peoples of the steppes and that we encounter in fact even in 
um, among the Pachinex. <coughs> but that, as we observed before, were present even in, and used similarly like in Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary, etc. Um, and uh, Russian terrain is kind of tough as well, so this favored, uh, especially in the forested areas, uh, certain timber fortifications and, and um, barrages, etc. But even in the steppes, telling you the truth, that were important to even as to, to build certain stations and fortifications for, for for favoring the crossing of armies in this. Uh, steps wilderness for hundreds of kilometers sometimes they needed garrisons they needed supplies and stocks and, and stuff like this and sometimes these posts were also garrisoned by the Kievan nomad allies right and um, and there is a continuity in, in the region uh, in terms of these field fortifications uh, even of mobile type with carts and wagons that will last for very very long time. Recently, we talked a lot even about early po medieval, uh, early modern Polish warfare. For example, how um, in the 16th century the, the Poles kind of re-easternized a bit their military culture because they had to deal with eastern threats in part, and they revived even as the, this uh, wagon fortifications at the time similarly to the people of the steppes. Um, so, progressively, um, you know, um, Kiev began to decline, right? It, it was mostly towards the north, uh, places like um, Vladimir Sutsdal in central eastern Russian Novgorod in the north in the 13th century that had become considerable military powers. Uh, the Kievan Rus had mm, weakened, perhaps because of the continuous warfare with neighboring enemies, but also probably with a certain split of society that couldn't hel hold the centralization. And and this is why even before the Mongol invasion, you find that the core professional, uh, the core of professional cavalry, the Druzina, um, supported by urban militia, various ma mercenaries, and rarely Suman peasant levy would make a, a standard Russian army. Um, mail at this point was the most common form of armor with scale or lamellar protections perhaps evolving into uh, the later coats of plates that was being developed in uh, actually mostly in Central Europe by the Germans in the 13th century. I mean th they were the ones that began that and eventually Europe got it all homogeneously. But at that point, you know, the Mongols arrived in Russia, so it's mostly like lamellar armor uh, around and plate armor being somewhat rare, at least in in the Western model types. Um, and what is interesting, in fact, is that these Eastern influences, for example, the Russians made still large use of of, of bows, um, in the 13th century, not crossbows, right? They were somewhat rare. I mean, they were there, they were there, but they preferred to use bows. Probably most of the reason being that, I mean, you can use crossbows on horseback, but kind of the, the typical model of uh, of cavalry is kind of horse archery, and that's where the Russians kind of stick to because of the influence of of other, uh, you know, of, of their enemies, right? Um, so, mm, in, in a certain sense, the degree of stagnation in central and Kievan Russian armies uh, is followed, is also favored, paved the road to the Mongol invasions. That, of course, had nothing to do with it properly, but you know they were favored by it at least. Um, in fact, th this whole story is a bit exaggerated. Like we we don't know how the, the Russians would have evolved if the Mongols would have not arrived, but. You know, the fact that a country fragments politically doesn't necessarily mean it's um, like for a, an involution of, of of tactics or, you know, it doesn't make sense. If anything, like a, a, f a fragmentation can bring to further m movement and warfare that from which new course can be formed. And in fact, as we were seeing before, with the northern principalities, like kind of new powers were emerging, right? Um, 
sure is though is is that um the mongols make a mess um and uh, russian military equipment in the later 13th and 14th century reflects the threat posed by uh this you know monstrosity that the mongol army had been uh, it was mostly about in fact cavalry warfare horse archery and and also in part shock uh, elite cavalry that wasn't after all that enormously different in terms of conceptually speaking from what the russians had already been acquainted to but now with a level of discipline of coordination that definitely these principalities couldn't cope at all with like the 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 f- you know success like the the ease with which the the mongols invaded russia is embarrassing like these guys invaded russia in winter and conquered it and and that's it like the end of the story and a very few people surviving to tell the tale um and uh i mean the mongols were enormous militarily speaking um, it, it, it's incredible what they 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 managed to achieve and uh in this sense the russians weren't anything special compared to you know all the enemies that the mongols had uh, met in other places of of asia that that wasn't that wasn't that weren't surely you know uh any worse than the russians or the, the other europeans um what can we make a long consideration about what the meaning of this like in perspective like would mongol warfare being surpassed by the, the russians basically adopt mongol warfare uh, like and that's it and that's how the russian armies basically up to the westernization of early m- modern times would kind of look like like the um russia remains objectively tied uh with its contacts with um with western europe but it not at the point to develop in, in similar patterns like up to the early modern era russian armies are literally mongol armies like there is no evidence as we were saying before um eventually pike and shot tactics change a big deal and that's where the russians in fact but you know the moscovy has emerged now we don't have the time to explain why and how but let's say that's what effectively beats um mongol tactics like mongol tactics didn't end at um vienna uh, at the end of the 17th century as people suggest uh the ottomans are also being very very different from from the mongols and um and especially you know the, the horse archery having been beaten um easily since the the early 16th century with pike and shot like that's it they do, it didn't go further than that so don't don't think it lived more than that actually um of course in those areas of asia where it still worked because populations were nomadic and whatever but you know as, as long as long as the russians arrived you know they managed to to conquer siberia in one shot just with gunpowder and pikes but that's it right um so mm, we could spend a, a last word for the situation in the north of russia it was kind of different like objectively at the end of the 14 uh, the 15th century when uh the uh, moscow conquers novgorod th- these two systems were radically different um at that point like novgorod was a mercantile republic following more kind of western uh patterns um like Novgorod had accepted Mongol suzerainty as well, but it kind of remained western fundamentally. It was so far that the Mongols basically never reached it, right? And uh considering that Novgorod fought um bitterly also against the Swedes and the Germans uh based on the in the Baltic states during the 13th century, um so the, the there was an early influence in those areas from and and sh- surely mongol influence arrived in there even in equipment etc but right and there is a, a debate going on as far as i know in terms of you know russian iconography at the time because the russians were totally in love with uh, constantinople and from their christianization onwards literally every single kind of uh, iconography was of byzantine mo- 
model, right? Um, so even when, like, of course, we have archaeological evidence that tells us, in fact, some, something slightly different. But you know, if you, even if you look at post-Mongol Russian art, they're depicting knights and uh, other fighters, like always in this kind of anachronistic, kind of classically inspired Byzantine fashion. But seemingly reality was very different. Like their equipment now didn't look at all like that, but it was basically Mongol as well, right? And it was that massive. And we we can't presume that the Russians were stressing that tradition, uh, Orthodox tradition, exactly to say, okay, that's that's what really differentiates uh, us from those guys. And following the Byzantine models were also quite crystallized uh, originally. Uh, like a sort of perpetual sanction of universality were, you know, stereotyped by the Russians and continued uh, in Russia even after the fall of the Byzantine Empire, um, while the reality was somewhat different. And in fact, I think the real glue of Russia at that point was really religion. Like, there wasn't anything much in common. Like, you know, what did had Moscow in common with, with, with Galicia, right? You know, the Let's be honest. Um, not, nothing if not, in fact, a, a common Russian church. That This is also what around around what uh, the Moscovy tried to recreate the, the wall of Russia, the, the imperialistic model of uh, the original idea that all these principalities technically had to be together. That was the older ideal that had actually never been achieved and that instead Russia would in the early modern period. And and we think that actually the the Russians also got the first firearms from the Mongols that weren't particularly fond of them. Actually, they disliked that um, they disliked firearms a lot, but they they also used them. And um, so it wasn't kind of an internal development. Western Europe mostly developed firearms from from Italy that especially during the Renaissance started in fact exporting a lot of uh, more than artillery proper than actually of advisors even to countries like Russia, Poland, etc. because they didn't have much of an artillery on their own um, and uh, but seemingly the Russians maintained this eastern context that we can't obviously focus particularly on because it's not very clear like but we can see that it was something different like Russia d detaches itself definitely a lot and especially even when Lithuania joins with Poland and not with Russia because technically this was feasible at, at the beginning uh, Russia is completely something it, it's cut out it, it's really not even difficultly conceivable as part of Europe as we we mean it in the modern sense during er the early modern period, like it's something truly on its own. Like you can't say they are Mongols. Of course, they weren't. They, they're something different. They're Russians, right? And this is very important when you study their political and military history, even today, right? Because that that's a legacy that they maintained in a, in a in a way that is very different from from our own. But uh, okay, I think we stop here, and I hope you appreciate it because I don't know how this turned like. Obviously, we will deal with all this stuff in detail one day, specifically. Um, but I think this is the omnicomprehensive picture that I would I, I wanted to draw. Like, and these are objectively the most interesting powers. We skipped Serbia, maybe, so we will have to talk about it somewhat soon. Um, but I, I think they exemplify pretty well the differences that existed into this broader area. I mean, we literally uh, started from Central Europe, then we, uh, going into the Southern uh, Balkans, then in Eastern Europe. And you see how many differences, how many influences, how many interactions, and how many similarities also, by a certain standard. Um, this great difficulty of putting things together and of giving a stability to centralism through central power that effectively is achieved more in places like uh, Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary. And uh, this resurgence of powers that also get invested by, I don't know, the Mongol invasion or uh, 
like with Bulgaria, you find the you know this this fate of gravitating around the Byzantine Empire and eventually the Latin Empire and all the upheavals and and still lands that were kind of in contact with each other. Maybe today we didn't focus ex extremely much on how, for example, there were contacts, I don't know, between Bulgaria and Hungary that were meaningful, even the clashes maybe with Bohemia, we talked about them in Hungary, uh, the connections with Poland, uh, even Russia, because actually Poland interfered with Russian affairs um, very early in time. You know, there would be a lot to say, and hopefully we will do it on another occasion. For now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.